Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe, the host and producer of The Chats. The Chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, December 1st, 2021, via Zoom, I'm speaking with Jason, also known as Leather Dad Jason, in uh, Ontario, Canada. Where, where exactly are you located? I'm actually in Niagara, just outside Niagara Falls. Okay, on the Canadian side. On the Canadian side. Yes. Yeah, we which can almost the, see America. <laughs> which has the, the Canadian side has the more beautiful uh, waterfall, hasn't it? It's true. It's true. I just spent a night there and it was absolutely stunning. Yeah, I haven't been there in a long time, but uh, yeah. So today we're going to talk a little bit about your history, a little bit about your world. Let's start off. Tell me a little bit about where you're from and about your growing up. Sure. So I am from Southern Ontario. I grew up in a tiny little hamlet called Vanessa, uh, surrounded by tobacco farms wow. and lived there for quite a while and then moved to a slightly bigger town of Grantford. And that's where I was um, all through my teenage years. And I grew up with my family, with my siblings, um, pretty run of the mill <laughs> growing up. Uh, and then as a teenager, I came out of the closet as uh, a lesbian and started to face a lot of violence, um, was beat up, had my house vandalized and broken into. Uh, and so that's when I decided to head to Toronto. So I packed up all of my stuff, got on a bus at 4 a.m. and went to Toronto and started living on the streets. And that's when I was about 18. Take us back a little bit to being bullied and having your house broken into. What was going on there? I think the atmosphere of the town at the time was, I mean, it was a small town. It was very homophobic. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of racial tension in the town. And um, and so things like, uh, like schoolyard fights and stuff were, I mean, not uncommon. Like, it's just something I grew up with. And... Uh, so as I as I started to come out, uh, people found out, and I mean, I had a few friends who were supportive, um, and a lot who weren't, and just suddenly turned. And one night, uh, two girls came that I knew and started questioning me about whether I was I was gay, and I said yes, and just started kicking me with those. Remember the the combat boots with the steel toe on the outside, the toe cap. Yes. with those like in the face and stuff and uh two women came out of a bar thankfully and called the police and if it weren't for them i don't know what would have happened so oh my gosh that's awful yeah yeah when when was this happening how how recently so that would have been that would have been the late 90s i think you know sometimes i reflect on how much things have changed because i don't i don't know that that would be the experience of someone uh, in that town now, which I mean is great. I would never want someone to have to go through, you know, the things that I hate to say I'm older, but I think when we talk about queer history and generational pieces, there is that that bit there. And, you know, so some of the things that us older folks have gone through, and especially, I mean, you know, the folks who came before me too. I'm slightly surprised to hear that because as an outsider looking at Canada, I've always seen Canada as very progressive. So to hear that there would be such violence going on is, I didn't expect that. I think, I think Canada is, I mean, in many ways we're different from the States. I think that we have stronger gun control. Um, our, our guns tend to just be used for hunting um, for the most part. Um, but I mean, we certainly have levels of violence. We have, um, you know, I, ongoing history of genocide and colonization towards indigenous people and racism towards you know folks uh, of other racial backgrounds and and so i think that i think canada in many ways is very progressive we're a very progressive country but i think we also you know have our have our hard stuff too and um i think sometimes you know the stereotypes of our country sort of overshadow the fact that um that we do have a long sordid history with all marginalized communities. Uh, take me back a bit to your coming out as a lesbian. How did that evolve for you? So I think I realized, 
I realized that I was probably more bisexual when I was 10 or 11. Um, I think at that point, I just didn't really have, have the words for it. There wasn't a huge uh, bi community. And certainly the word queer was just in sort of in the beginning of the process of being reclaimed and wasn't sort of in our vernacular as, as a positive identity. Um, and yeah, I, I think I just, I really recognized that I was attracted to, to lots of different people. And I had to do more with the people than, uh, than their gender. And um, started to come out. I came out to my best friend and, uh, she was like, that's fine. But like, you can't tell anybody, um, like you'll get killed. This is not good. Um, and so it was a few years before I came out. Really. I was probably about 15 or 16, uh, when I started coming out a lot more publicly and came out to my family. Uh, my family was good. I mean, they struggled a bit at first, but I'm really lucky to have a, a family who has accepted me in all of my little quirks. So, what other little quirks do you have? <laughs> oh man, where would I even start? Well, I think <laughs> part of part of struggling with my sexuality, um, and and I think part of living in a small town where there wasn't good sex education. Um, meant that there was a lot of teen pregnancy where I was from. So I actually had my first uh, baby when I was uh, 16, well, 15, almost 16. Wow. Um, and my parents were really good about it. Like they just, they've always, my mom always said, you can be whatever you want to be. Like, we'll still love you. Um, and so they've been supportive. I mean, they, they've had their moments, their parents. I'm a parent, I get it. Um, but, you know, have, have really stood by me and my family. And I'm really grateful for that. And how old is your child? I don't know whether you have a daughter, a son. Yeah, so I, I have three children. Um, my oldest is 25, oh. and I have a 14-year-old, an 11-year-old, and we're actually raising our grandson, who's four. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so it's a, it's a full house. Yes, yes. I can't help then but ask, as someone in, in the general LGBTQ community, how is it raising children? I, I think it's changed a lot. I think for sure, I mean, having having a child in the 90s and being a teen parent, um, you know, it was at a time when it was still really hard for queer folks um, to get pregnant, to have access to things like fertility treatments and such. And so most of the people that I knew that were queer who had families were older. Um, you know, they had been married, they had had kids, um, eventually uh, split up with their partners and, you know, gone on to live their lives. Um, so there wasn't a lot of support back then. I find now, um, now that there's more access and that there's uh, in Canada more health coverage for things like fertility uh, treatments, there's a lot more queer folks having kids or having alternative family structures and setups. Um, and so I, it hasn't really been an issue. I mean, my kids, I don't think they've ever really faced discrimination, um, because of our sexuality and, you know, are raised in a house where we just believe that consent is key and that's what's important. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're, we're really lucky that way. Very, very good. Um, yeah, this concept of consent is becoming more and more prevalent. We're seeing more and more of it. Oh, how for do sure. you see that? Like, how do I see it sort of becoming as, as more a prevalent? Concept, how, how do you teach the concept of consent to your children? Right. I think, um, I mean, with us, we start at a super young age. Like, they don't have to hug people or kiss people that they don't want to, even if it's family members. Um, you know, modeling good behavior, just like, do you want me to tickle you? Is this still okay? Do you want me to stop? Um, do you want me to give you a kiss tonight? I uh, just, I think when we give kids that choice, like they, it just becomes ingrained in them, right? It becomes something that they do naturally. Um, and so, I mean, even the four-year-old will come up and say like, oh, can I give you a hug? Um, and I think that when we start really early, it, it becomes more a part of just how, how people interact in the world. Um, and for us too, I think, you know, we've always been really open about other families. We're in a 
like polyamorous family. Our family, our kids know that. Obviously, they have three parents living with them, and uh, and so just really talking about the fact that you know families come in all different shapes and sizes, and um, and that people make different choices with their life, and that's fine as long as they're not hurting anybody. Um, but that they have to be consenting. And I, and as our kids get older and we start, you know, having the sex talk and stuff, you know, there, there's a little bit of threatening, like it, it better be consensual, whatever you choose to do, you know, it, it better be. And, and so they get that that's, I think, one of our core values as a family. Tell me a little bit more about being a polyamorous family. How do you make that work? <laughs> well, I, um, so my husband and I have been together for almost 21 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and we have been non-monogamous for most of that relationship. Um, I think that when we got together, uh, I was already, I was already pretty involved in the leather community. And, um, and a lot of my exposure to the gay community, like when I first, you know, got on the streets in Toronto was to the gay men's community. And, the men that I was hanging out with weren't monogamous. And so it just, for me, was almost an essential part of a queer identity at the time, as I understood it. Like you were queer, you weren't monogamous. That's just sort of how it went. Um, and so for us, I mean, we've been non-monogamous for, yeah, 21 years. Um, I have another live-in partner and I met her uh, probably 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And she was just sort of a, a family friend, like in the distance. Um, and eventually we ended up hooking up and falling in love. And uh, my husband was like, well, why doesn't she move in with us? We have to move anyway. She's coming to the city for school. So this is perfect. And it just worked out really well. The kids immediately took to her and, um, you know, we sort of eased them into it a bit, but she became their third parent. And I, uh, we've been we've been really lucky like i understand that not many people have the life experience that we have where um we're 99 percent out we're out pretty much everywhere except for um one of our jobs uh it wouldn't be particularly safe but um we are out we're out at our kids school we you know moved a year ago from toronto into a small rural farming area um and it just hasn't been an issue uh, at all. People get it. And I think that, I think folks are just really, you know, happy that our kids are surrounded by love. And and I think when you see our family, like there's so much love emanating from us and that's what we put into the community as well. Um, you know, we volunteer and do lots of other stuff uh, in community. And so I think that folks respect that. Why the move? Why the move? Because Toronto is so bloody expensive. <laughs> um, part of it was, I mean, expense. I, I mean, we were paying so much in rent and knew that we would never be able to own a house in Toronto. Um, and I think that's the reality for most people uh, now. Uh, and we, all three of us grew up in sort of rural farm communities or with farm experience. And uh, it was something that we had always talked about, but they I don't know that living in Toronto, like we really thought it was a reality. And then uh, my husband's family homestead came up for sale uh, mm -hmm. unexpectedly. And we were able to purchase a small house and turning it into a hobby farm. And um, it's nice. I mean, we're close enough to Toronto, you know, we can still do stuff in the community and uh, go in and come home. Uh, but we get the experience of country living and it's, wonderful it's exciting it's so good for the kids um and it's it's just a slower pace of life which which is needed so let's take a step back to your arrival in toronto you said you lived on the streets tell yeah. us about that what was going on yeah so i arrived in toronto um i immediately went to a youth shelter, a Catholic run youth shelter, um, because I had seen advertisements for it on TV. So it was kind of, I knew that that support was there. Um, arrived, I was there for a while. It turned out it was really homophobic and not a super safe space. Um, so I spent some time living in shelters, uh, lived on the streets, squatting in abandoned buildings. Uh, at the same time though, it was, 
I mean, I was coming from a small town where I knew I had seen newspaper articles about pride the year before in Toronto and was blown away and didn't really understand sort of, you know, how big and extravagant it was, um, even back then. I mean, now it's a million times larger, but I, I remember there was a trans girl staying at the shelter with me and she was having a horrible time. Um, they were making her dress like a man. They wouldn't let her like go on. There was like a trip to the Toronto zoo that we were going on and she wasn't allowed to go unless she dressed like a man. And so she was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm not going. Do you want to come with me to church street? And I was like, church street. Why, why on earth would we want to go to a street full of churches? This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, and she was like, no, 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 it's the gay village. Have you never been there? And I was like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. And she was like, oh my gosh, come on. I remember we went and we sat at Baskin Robbins, which was across the street from Second Cap, which is where like the iconic steps in Toronto yes. um, used to be. And I remember sitting there just looking over at the steps and, you know, it was early September. Everyone was out. It was just such a beautiful afternoon. And I had no idea that there were so many gay people anywhere, let alone that, you know, there was like a village where they all just hung out together. And um, it was just such an eye opening experience. And so for me, that sort of became my home base. And I, whether I was squatting or in shelters, I mean, we'd get up in the morning, uh, I was going to school at the time, go to school, and then just go straight to the village and hang out and uh, learn. And I, I think it was on the steps, really, that I, you know, learned so much about queer history and queer culture. And uh, I remember, you know, the old bears would sit down next to me. I was you know, 17 at the time, and they'd sit down and just tell me all these stories about like when they came out and where they were from. And it was so magical. For the benefit of the audience, would you please explain what the steps were? Yeah, definitely. Um, so the steps, which were made famous in sketches by a Canadian show called Kids in the Hall, uh, were there was just a coffee shop and there were literally just steps in front of it. Um, almost what we would call wedding steps if it was on a church. Uh, and everyone would just sit there and hang out. And it was just amazing. I mean, there was probably room for, oh my gosh, like 80 people to sit on those steps and everyone would just sit there and cruise. And remember years later, I lived in the village um, and I was always excited that first like warm spring day where you could serve wore shorts because I knew that all the guys would be out on the steps in their short shorts cruising <laughs> each other and, um, you know, bringing that life back after winter. And it was just so exciting. So uh, the steps existed for a very long time. Eventually, uh, the second cup was purchased by new owners and they got rid of the steps. Um, it's been something I think that there's been talk of bringing back in some of the newer architecture going up in Toronto. So we'll see if that happens. But I think I think it was an important place because I think often in the community, you know, we have places that um, are bars and so they're not accessible to people under 19 or folks who aren't comfortable uh, in places serving alcohol. Um, or places, you know, it, it's expensive to go places. Like you have to buy tickets or you have to, you know, you're expected to pay for drinks the whole time you're somewhere. And just to have somewhere free that folks could gather and, and have conversations, I think is something that we really need in our communities. Tell us more about the gay village you discovered. <laughs> it was, it was before it got gentrified. It's really gentrified in the last, you know, 10, 10, 15 years. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. When I arrived, I mean, there was second cup and the steps and upstairs uh, was soy, which was supporting our youth, which is an organization that still exists. Um, that runs just amazing program for LGBT IQ youth. Um, there were still two lesbian bars. There was uh, Tango's, which was, Tango's and Cruz still exist. Cruz is the men's bar. Um, but at some point around, I think probably 2004, 2005, um, they made it into one bar. So there used to be a wall separating oh. the women's side from the men's side. Okay. Um, and so we still, we had that. And there was Pope Jones over on uh, Parliament Street, which was a women's bar. And I mean, that's where I first met a lot of uh, older women in the community. Uh, some of the butches who 
you know, took me under their arm and they're like, Hey, this is, this is how you have to act when you're a butch. And, um, wow. And uh, I mean, there were just so many, you know, we had glad day, which was, uh, which is the world's oldest uh, LGBTQ bookstore. It was on Young Street at the time, a block away, but still very much there. I mean, the Black Eagle was there. Um, and at that point, I just knew it was that very scary bar that I would never go in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the I think, like, most of the businesses on the street were, like, queer run or, like, really queer oriented i guess um a lot of that has changed now i think that there's been some businesses that have moved in recently really trying to get back to that sort of grassroots feeling but i don't i don't know if it'll happen because the with the housing prices in toronto like people are so spread out all yeah. over the city so you sort of get different pockets of the community which i mean is sometimes good sometimes not great so Let's go back to when you were in, um, I forgot the name of the bar you said, where the, you were meeting all the women. Oh, Pope Jones. Pope Jones. Tell us more about that. How, wh what were these people teaching you about being a butch? <laughs> um, it, was, it was interesting because I feel like for coming out in the late 90s, I still managed to come out into almost like a tail end of second wave feminism. Um, oh. And, you know, there was still a lot of women in the community who were going to the Michigan Women's Music Festival, um, were, you know, still identifying as separatist lesbians, were really transphobic. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a important part of, of our history to talk about because it shows how far we've come, but also how recent that has existed in our community. And, um, and so, I mean, there was a lot a lot still of, you know, a lot of separatism and like, oh, you don't want to hang out with the men and men are misogynistic. And, um, you know, us women have to stick together. And um, yeah, and it, it was interesting. Like I found that often a lot of older women flocked towards me, but really to be like, this is how you have to behave. Like this is, you know, you don't date femmes, you only date other butches, which is like a stark contrast to you know, the butch femme scene in Toronto from like, you know, the twenties onwards. Um, and I think, I think for me, like, I, I appreciate it because it gives me, a, I think a richer sense of our history and where we came from. I think that maybe if I had shown up in Toronto, even a few years later, I wouldn't have had that experience and, and had to make, make those decisions and question things for myself around where my politics would be and, and how I would exist in community. That's a very strong statement. Yeah, it, it's one of those things, you know, I, I'm grateful for it, even though, like, I certainly was a jerk at times. Um, I certainly definitely, you know, there were moments where I probably didn't treat people the way that they deserve to be treated. I was young and still figuring myself out and figuring out the community. Um, but I think it also has taught me, you know, I've seen community at its best and its worst. And uh, I'm quite invested in seeing how we can make it at its best. What's the best you've seen? Oh my gosh. I think, you know, things like, uh, I think it's the, uh, PWA people with AIDS. I think they're the ones who do the bike rally every year to raise money, um, for HIV research and awareness. Um, I've had so many friends do that. I mean, they bike from Toronto to Montreal and it's just an amazing thing. It's amazing that when people will, you know, I think put their bodies out there and, and do hard work to, to raise money, um, and awareness for issues in our community. Um, I often think about the AIDS foundation and, you know, they, for a long time did a lot of workshops around BDSM and I'm sure like, we'll talk about that. Um, but, but as an organization, like that's, it's a risky thing to do, you know, to, to put yourself out there and sort of be like, Hey, like we need funding and government funding. And also we're supporting this community. Um, and I, I just think about the little things, you know, I, I knew people who would buy a coffee for street kids, right. And, um, help folks get winter coats when they didn't have them. And, 
um, do those little pieces, supporting local businesses, right? We're still really lucky to have some of the smaller businesses. And, um, and now a lot of us, you know, who at that age were, I mean, street kids together now have master's degrees and are, you know, we have incomes and are still trying to go back and support those businesses. And, um, there's a, I remember, so I was one of the squeegee kids who would like squeegee windows for money back oh. in the nineties. And, and it was hugely contentious. It was eventually made illegal in Toronto. Um, but Dudley Hardware on Church Street um, would, they always had a bucket of squeegees in the back and they would sell them to us for two or three dollars, like almost at cost. And they were always so respectful and nice. And so anytime I'm in the village and, you know, I need some hardware related thing, I'll still go back there and buy it from them and often say to them, you know, like, I always remember that, like, you guys gave us squeegees and, and you were respectful towards us. Like you really, you saw what we were doing and, um, and I still appreciate that, you know, 20 something years later. So now what were you, were you washing store windows, car windows, car windows? Oh, okay. Yeah. What's the worst you've seen in the community? I mean, I think, you know, there has always been people in the community who are full of drama, who search drama out. And, and we're not talking about just being like, you know, kind of dramatic, like friend gossip type stuff. I think that, you know, there are folks in every community who it seems like all they can see is the negativity and they, they, they search it out, they increase it. Um, I, you know, I think our community has um, a lot of racism. It has sexism. Uh, there, you know, there's so many groups in our community that still are underrepresented, even though um, they're not necessarily underrepresented in the makeup of Toronto. I mean, it's one of the most diverse cities in the world. Um, and we still have a predominantly white gay community that's visible. Um, I think, you know, transphobia runs deep in the community. Um, I think it has such a long history. And I think that uh, there are still things that people do that perpetuate violence against trans people that they don't even necessarily realize they're still doing. Such um, I think a little just comments, like when you make, you know, you'll hear someone like make fun of someone who maybe isn't quote unquote passing as they walk by or something and uh, not recognizing that, you know, trans folks lives are hard. Like it's, it's hard and people don't have access to things or, or maybe that's how people want to present. Right. And, and not respecting folks choices for that. Um, you know, I, I think there's so much sizeism in our community. I think that, um, that there's still a lot of fat phobia and, you know, preference on a certain physique and body type, both, in men's and women's communities. Um, I don't think it's exclusive to one. And I, so I think that, you know, I think as a community, like we have to be able to look at ourselves and say, um, like, what kind of community do we want? Like, do we want one where we all sort of band together, um, remember our history, remember our roots, remember that, that even today, you know, there's lots of folks who can't, it's not safe for them to come out or like the queer community is the only place that they, they have that, you know, feeling of safety. Um, and are, are we going to make it a good place and a positive place where people are, are safe and, and upheld, or are we just going to, you know, perpetuate these sort of isms over and over again? You said there are some groups that are underrepresented, for example, I think, uh, black folks, folks from South Asian communities, um, I think trans people, I think for the number of trans people and then the number of trans people that we actually see in community or especially in positions of power within our community. Um, I, I think young people, I think that, you know, often there's people in their, you know, maybe their twenties, but I think unless you're old enough for the bar scene, um, often, you know, young folks voices aren't, aren't being heard. And I mean, I do a lot of work with youth just in general. And, you know, we have this amazing group of kids, you know, even 10, 11 years old who can grasp sexuality and gender and diverse identities and, um, 
And I know until I started like really working with youth, I had no idea. I had no idea that this was even on their radar because it certainly wasn't when, you know, I was 10. Um, and I think they would serve us well to hear them. I also think that there are seniors in our community who, um, you know, don't get to go to events because they need a ride, um, who yeah. are housebound, who are isolated, who aren't seen as sexual, um, you know, have a hard time finding partners, um, aren't taken seriously. And, and I think that that age gap is such a huge thing, right? Like, we're lucky to have those elders in our community, right? Like, we know that so many got wiped out by the AIDS crisis. Like, it's, you know, to have to have older people in our community is such a blessing. And to be able to figure out how to have those intergenerational conversations, too, where we get those 10-year-olds, we get those, you know, 90-year-olds, and have those conversations um, would be amazing. Totally agreed. Tell us about coming out into the leather kink fetish community. <laughs> oh, I love this story. So I, <laughs> when I first got to Toronto, um, there was a store, it's still there, called Out on the Street. Mm -hmm. And they sold um, lots of different, you know, sort of gay stuff. Um, but one big thing that they had was patches. And so I had bought some patches. So I bought a rainbow flag and I bought the leather flag. But at the time, uh, someone had told me that it was the lesbian flag. And I, I was like, okay. So I sat in a conference uh, and this woman came up to me and she was like, talking to me and she was like hey do you, do you know what that means and she's like pointing at the leather flag and I was like yeah obviously I know what it means it means I'm a lesbian clearly you are too and she's like no but like you do know what it means and I was like yeah like I know what it means in my head I was like why is she giving me such a hard time so then she was like well there's this like women's BDSM discussion group that happens do you want to come with me next time? And I was like, in my head, I was like, how does she know I'm interested in this? This is so confusing. Um, after that, I realized I had been walking around for quite some time with leather flags on my backpack and my hoodie at the time, uh, thinking it was just the lesbian flag. So, <laughs> um, and I, re I remember, um, you know, I, I think what first piqued my interest, I, I had a partner at the time and she, she was really into reading. Um, and so, I mean, she, you know, gave me the story of, O, um, and we were listening to, to music that had sort of references to BDSM in it. And, um, and, and so when this woman invited me to this meeting, I, I was like, I don't even know what this would be like. Like, I have no idea. And walked into, it was at the 519 community center, which is part of the village. And, um, there was this big upstairs meeting room and we walked into it and, there had to be like 30 or 45 women in there. And I was terrified. I was clearly the youngest. Um, I mean, there are, you know, these big old daddy butches with like leather jackets and femmes with the heels that went on for days. And <laughs> I, I remember we like went around and everyone introduced themselves and I think said like whether they were a top or a bottom like that, that was the big thing. And I was like, I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I have no idea. I probably just chose bottom because I was like, clearly I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I, I had that experience in the women's community and, and I didn't go back to a meeting for quite some time. Um, uh, it was a bit overwhelming, but at the same time, I also was hanging around with a lot of gay men and a lot of them were leather men um, and like bears in the community. And you know, we, we'd be sitting on the steps and I'd hear these like stories of like the day after of, oh, I went to such and such, you know, party and there were like crosses everywhere and so, so and so was getting whipped. And I was like, I'm mm. so intrigued by this, but, um, but it also felt like this, like, I don't know, like I, I knew that as a person who was female identified, like I was not welcome in that space. <laughs> it was very much like a gay men's space and just imagine what it was like, you know, it was, um, it's kind of like watching the movie cruising. Like you just imagine what happened in all the other scenes. So, um, yeah. And, um, eventually I, I found my way back into the discussion group and, um, 
met other leather dykes and my partner um was into kink stuff and um and just became part of the community we started going to play parties and um yeah that that was sort of it. it and for me like it almost sort of in the same way that non-monogamy felt like an extension of a queer identity like so did kink i think that within a couple of years like we were so surrounded by people who were in the kink community um that that just became for me like almost like part of my queer identity like they were inseparable in many ways okay um yeah so that's how that's how i got involved in the community what are your thoughts on some of the things that you saw or enjoyed i i remember the first time that i went to patricia marsh's dungeon which uh is in toronto and it's it's beautiful i mean it's this victorian house that has all of this play equipment and you know there's like a, a medical room and a school room and a boudoir and sort of this cross-dressing room and and i remember walking in and just being like oh my gosh like this this is the kind of thing that you like would see in a movie but like it's real so i think you know I was just amazed that like these things I had read about in books and, and had sort of seen on TV were actual like real places and people did this stuff. Um, and it, it kind of felt like I was in on a big secret too, right? Like when you're going to these locations for play parties and it's like, there's like a password or like, you have to like know somebody who knows somebody to get in and be vetted. Um, I mean, it was really exciting. Like I was so young, I was you know, 20, like mm. what a crazy world to be in. Um, and, and now I realize like now that I'm in my forties and have been around in the community for like more than 20 years, um, that, that I think a lot of the things I had access to, like I was really privileged to, um, you know, I think that in Toronto we have, um, this amazing kink scene. It definitely has like ebbed and flowed over the years, but, um, I think I'm really lucky that like I found my place and found people also who are willing to to teach me things um, because I think that's such a huge component. So, was there anything shocking? Oh my god, yeah. <laughs> you tell. I remember. I remember once being at like a women's camping event and walking into the woods this is like probably the first time i'd ever seen someone playing i remember walking into the woods and this like big butch woman walked up and was like do you do you know what you're about to see and i was like yeah i know what i'm about to see and then there was like this woman and she was like naked and tied to a tree and there were all these tops like whipping her with like like bull whips and like floggers like just all taking turns and I was like, oh my gosh, I had no idea what I was about to see. <laughs> um, that was pretty shocking. I think that, I'm trying to think, like, like I think that, you know, at first everything was a bit surprising. Like your first time seeing knife play, your first time seeing people playing with needles, like it's surprising. The first time seeing people do water sports, I was like, oh, like people admit that they're into this. Like, I think that was part of it too. Like just people doing this in public. I think also the shock of seeing people with diverse bodies who were, you know, naked in public, playing, having people really into their bodies. Like as a fat person, I was like, wow, like this is, you know, I've always been taught to like cover up for purity, but also cover up because I'm fat and I don't deserve these things. And, and so just to see like people playing and being comfortable with their bodies um, was incredible to me. Is there anything you wish you had done differently in that whole journey? Hmm. That's a good question. I think it would have been interesting to travel a bit more. Um, I mean, we definitely, we were students at the time, like we, we didn't have much money. So I had never been to like an international like competition or anything like that. And I think that, I think maybe going to one, 
even one would have, you know, sort of changed my perspective on how big the community was because I knew that that we had this in Toronto. I knew that, you know, there was like Mr. Leather Toronto and Ms. Leather Toronto. Um, but I didn't really understand like like the gravity of of how big the community was and how connected it was, right? Um, I think that's probably it. I really was a, like, I mean, I'm a huge fan of saying yes. And so I think that, you know, if an opportunity came, like I jumped at it. So I was really, I think I'm lucky in that way because I went to lots of educational stuff. I went to lots of parties. Um, there wasn't a lot that I shied away from. So I think in terms of what I had access to, um, I don't have a lot of regrets. You mentioned you went to a lot of educational stuff. Tell us more about that. What kinds of things did you attend? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, there was the women's discussion group, which uh, I was peer led. And so it was, um, you know, someone would have a topic every, I think it was every month and we would get together and discuss it and have demos. And um, that's where I learned, you know, about everything from boot blacking to flogging to um, talking about identities in the community, like all the different, you know, like daddies and sirs and mommies and bottoms. And um, I, like I mentioned before, the AIDS committee used to do these amazing workshops. Um, I mean, they would fly people in from the States and, you know, I remember like being in workshops with people like, like Guy Baldwin and just, you know, and, and people that I don't know if at the time, because I was so new, I really understood like how important these people were, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I knew that they were sort of a big deal, but now, um, uh, especially as, as people have passed away too, and you know, their legacy is sort of being honored. I'm like, wow, like I, you know, I sat in a room with that person for a whole weekend and learned about interrogation or needle play. Um, and I think those workshops were really important too, because I think coming from the AIDS committee, you know, they were really focused on harm reduction and safety. Um, and so, and, and they were exciting workshops. So a lot of people went. And so I think it set a standard of like the level of knowledge in our community and, and safe play that um, they don't know exists anymore, to be honest. I think that, um, I think that when those stopped, you know, we lost a huge piece of information. Um, I think the big thing for me, so in, I think it was 2004, um, I actually flew to Texas to attend boys training camp in yeah, Dallas. Tell us more about that because that was a question I was going to bring up. Yeah. So it, um, so there were a few people from Toronto who had gone the year before um, and had like come back to the discussion group and were like, we just had this weekend. It was amazing. And I was like, okay, I have to go and like saved up and scrounged everything so that I could go the next year. Um, and basically it was, it was a weekend uh, in Dallas. I don't know how many years it happened for. Um, I think it happened one year after the year I was there and then sort of closed down. Um, but you would, you would send in an application and it was like a really intense application outlining like why you wanted to go. Um, and then if you were collared, your top or sir or daddy or whoever it was would actually have to sign a consent saying that you had permission to go and that you were collared to the event for the weekend. Uh, uh. Um, and, and so getting there, I mean, it was, I think there were 25 of us who attended as attendees um, from all over North America. And there were just lots of people who were, they weren't all tops or daddies. Like there were other submissives there. There were slaves there um, who sort of made up the staff team and ran workshops like the whole, I think it was four days long um, around everything from, from protocol and, you know, high leather dinners to this is how you keep yourself safe. Um, collaring are you sure you're a boy is that how you identify as you know a submissive like is this what's right for you how do you watch out for other submissives in the community who especially ones who aren't collared um you know and, and a lot of it focused on sort of that i say brotherhood but like in a very gender neutral way that that brotherhood of of identifying as a leather boy regardless of your gender and and how 
how we make that community and, and share knowledge and keep each other safe. There was, I mean, there was a play party, uh, the one night that was sort of like the big event, uh, that we had and it was all stations of the cross. So you could go around and just, you know, go up to whoever was running and be like, Hey, like, I have no experience with this. This is what I'd like. And, and it was nice because the, um, the tops who were running it, like, they knew that that's what was expected. And so they were like gentle, right? Like they were like, okay, like let, let me help you walk through this. And, and really, I mean, I think, you know, demonstrated like how to negotiate a scene in a really good way, um, which was great too. And so it was just an amazing learning experience. I mean, I met incredible people. Um, it for me, I think taught me a lot about, you know, a, less about like the technical parts of DS and more about the community parts, right? Like how, how do you show respect in the community? What do you do when someone doesn't reserve, deserve respect in the community? How do you look out for, for other people? Um, you know, how, how do subs keep the community running in some ways in terms of charity events and volunteering and, um, and how do you carry yourself? How do you carry yourself as a leather person? Um, regardless of your role, um, you know, I, I think there'd be some people in the community who would like refer to it as like, you know, that, that sort of old guard leather, which is like a whole loaded thing. But, but I think that piece around protocols, around respect in the community. And, um, and I think that that, that was a really important piece and I, I loved it. It was absolutely life changing on so many levels and, um, yeah, and I wish that more events like that existed now, for sure. Do you identify as a boy, a sub? So I did for many, many years. I was in service, identified as a leather boy. Um, took a break from the community for a while, just, you know, was having kids, doing a master's degree, that whole thing. Um, and ended up in... A, relation I mean I had always identified as a switch when it came to play but it ended up in a relationship um as a daddy and love it I absolutely love it I think that um for me I think part of that community building piece I'm so passionate about is also about caregiving and I feel like as a daddy like I I'm able to care for um for people in the community and for you know some submissives and boys and i just i like being in that role i like the mentorship piece i also like you know beating boys and ah. um having them around <laughs> serving girls too i mean so um <laughs> i'm definitely i'm not one of those people who thinks that like that there's this progression like if you're a boy then you become a daddy or hmm. if you were a daddy like you necessarily had to be a boy and i i'm always really clear about that that um, I don't think that there's that progression. I think that, you know, there's people who are boys who will be boys for life and they're so good at what they do. Um, I also think that there's some daddies who would be awful boys. They'd be terrible boys. They're respectful. Yeah. They, you know, really care about how they treat submissives, but I don't think they could do it themselves because it's a really hard position. It's, you know, one of the most difficult things I think in our community. Um, and, and so I think, you know, I just like to be clear that for me like that, it's been my journey, but it certainly is not for everybody. You alluded to something, you mentioned something when you were talking about the boys training, uh, I, I forgot the training camp. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, you said that there was discussion about how to treat people who do not deserve respect in the community. Tell us a little bit about that. I find that fascinating. Yeah, I think that I think that there was this expectation, depending on which communities you were a part of or what circles you were moving in, that especially so as a boy, I was expected, you know, there was this community expectation that I would refer to everybody with their titles. So whether it was sir or daddy or master, um, that, you know, if someone told me to do something like I think there's this idea um, in some communities that like a submissive is like the community submissive. Yes. And so, you know, you can just turn around and be like, Hey boy, get me a beer. And like, for some reason you deserve that. Um, and I think that, you know, in some situations 
it's fine in some situations, you know, depending. Um, there are there are certainly you know boys in our community who who do a lot of service for other people um but i think that there is this expectation and i think that often what you see is that there are people in our community who tend to be the ones who have a lot of red flags around them who just don't don't show respect to other people and i think don't show respect to boys like even if you're asking a random boy to get you something like like there either has to be some negotiation or at least some respect right yes. like and and there's lots of people who don't show that and so i think you know clarifying that like for myself in the community i mean there's people i don't like there's people that i don't think um you know deserve much respect because of how they carry themselves and how they treat others and i'm always kind to them because that's the person that i am like i i always treat people with respect whether they deserve it or not but i think there's a huge difference between that and holding someone up in the community as a leader in their position mm -hmm. so for instance my boy knows in his contract that he's always expected to be respectful if we're at an event but it's up to him whether he ever uses honorifics for somebody. And he only uses honorifics if he feels that they deserve that respect. Fascinating. Um, because I would never ask him to call someone sir, who, you know, is known for treated, treating people badly. You don't earn that title, or you earn that title. You don't just get it. In the same way that, you know, the people who call me, um, who call me daddy or sir in the community, like they know me, they've seen me, they know who I am. And I certainly would not expect someone else's boy to call me daddy or another, you know, another top in the community, um, unless they felt that I had, I, that I had earned that. It's, you know, I'm a big fan of like still earning leather and the, that piece. Um, and I think that titles are also something that have to be earned. I would agree. Yes. Let's take a step slightly over to one side. You have been a facilitator at the Women in Trans SM discussion group. Is that different from the other one you've referenced? A little bit. So so that group was started in the 90s. I mean, it ran for over a decade um, and then just sort of ended um, for quite a while. And I knew that, but there were still lots of things going on in the community. Um, but like I said, I sort of left the community for a while, went off, was doing other stuff and came back to it. And I was, I was excited because I thought it was going to look exactly the same way it always had. I thought that, you know, and I, I think that whole time in my head, I was like, oh, it's fine. I'm like taking this little break because I'm going to come back and all these things are still going to be here for me. Um, and it wasn't true. Um, I, you know, my boy was brand new into leather kink the community and I was like you know this is great like we'll we'll go to workshops like you know I could brush up my skills like I'm always learning new things and this will be great and there just wasn't anything um and I kept I kept telling like these like nostalgic stories about like this women's discussion group and you know how great it was and um and finally we were we were at a women's leather like meetup at the Black Eagle and it was like the first time that I had seen a lot of people in, I mean, years. And I finally turned to him and I was like, you know, why don't we see if we can start that discussion group again? Like, is this something that you're willing to commit your time to? And, you know, and also be a little bit more out, right? Because once you're, you're doing sort of more stuff in the community, like there's more chance of you being out and people knowing. And, and he was like, yeah, let's, let's do it. And, um, and so I talked to the original person, I mean, who had started the group and, and I just said like, you know, this is the loss I'm feeling in the community. This is why I think this is important. I think that, you know, sometimes a break is good and, you know, we can make the changes that needed to be changed. I think, you know, specifically naming trans people as like a core part of the group um, was really important. And can I have your blessing to start it again? And she was like, yeah, go ahead. So we've been running it now, I think for three years. Um, and we were, we were meeting at Glad Day, um, 
which was wonderful, although very tiny. But I think that also speaks to the lack of queer space in Toronto mm. now. The spaces that do exist are so, like, in such high demand. Um, but we we were meeting at Glad Day, and, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, some folks that were the people I consider to be, like, the older people with knowledge when I was young came out to the meetings. There were lots of new, younger folks. Um, and things were going good. We hosted some play parties. It was a lot of fun. And then COVID hit. Yeah. Um, and as soon as COVID hit, we made the decision to go online and start meeting over Zoom, um, thinking it would just be a couple months. Like, I think that's what everybody thought, right? Yeah, <laughs> no that's... matter what. Um, and we made that decision and had good attendance. And, you know, I, th I think it offers a different way of doing workshops too um especially you know the opportunity to be anonymous um we don't you know force people to turn on their cameras and stuff um although most people do and i and over the course of i mean the year and a half of the pandemic we have i think our group online now has like 300 members we always get about 35 to 40 people out to like each month's discussion um they're still uh, facilitated by members of the community. Um, so it's all volunteer. Um, for me, I, I want it, I want people to feel like it's their group and that they have a responsibility also towards educating other people in the community. Um, and we have people joining us from all over the world now. Um, you know, even as far away as Scotland, um, it's been amazing. And so we've made the decision that even once we can start meeting back in person, uh, that we're going to continue doing the online monthly meeting because it's also allowed us to, you know, have access to other facilitators and other people who have different experience. And it's been amazing, but it's also been a really great way, I think, to stay connected as a community. Mm. Um, you know, we were, we were kind of contemplating what to do in December because it's a couple days after Christmas and, you know, folks are busy and uh, still made the decision just to have a social night and we'll just play some online games and, you not really have a discussion, but I think, you know, we recognize the need and, and we have that need um, for people to still come together in community, especially when we're so isolated, yeah. um, even as things are kind of opening up again. What's been the biggest challenge in managing that? I think the biggest challenge has probably been, I think one of them is getting facilitators. I think that there is this expectation that people have that if like if they want to facilitate on something they have to be an expert and um and we really try to do away with that like i always say you know you you don't have to be an expert you just have to be able to lead a conversation and we can even help with that uh -huh. um because i think you know one of the beauties of a two hour long discussion is that you know you get input from other people so let's say we're talking about uh flogging right like there's all different people who know different pieces and so it's that information sharing but i also you know i want to encourage people who might not have experience public speaking leading groups doing education pieces um you know to help mentor them to get the like to have those skills um mm -hmm. and i feel like our group is a really you know kind and generous group where you can you know uh you can mess up and it's not a big deal, like no one cares. And so I'm hoping that, you know, people are, are getting those skills and, and people are starting to facilitate like more than once. Um, because I think it would be great if, you know, especially like some of the younger people in our group are like, you know, in their early twenties, imagine if they have this experience and then in their thirties become, you know, educators in the wider yeah. King community, it would be incredible. And so I, I would love, that to be a piece that grows out of our group. But I think, you know, bolstering people's self-esteem and saying like, it, it's fine, it's fine that you have no experience, you have no idea what you're doing. Like, like let's, you know, meet by Zoom ahead of time and we can walk you through it and how how to do this. And, um, and let's talk about this topic that you think no one wants to talk about. From your perspective, what are some of the differences you notice between the Canadian scene and for example, the U.S. scene or other scenes? Oh, that's a good one. I think, <clears throat> I think one of the big, 
I don't know if it's a difference or not, but I think that Americans don't understand how expensive it is for Canadians to travel. So I notice a lot of the time, like Americans seem to go from event to event to event. um, And, and it's not terribly expensive. I mean, it's definitely very financially challenging for, for a number of people. Mm. Um, But I think in comparison to Canadians, First of all, if we're traveling to the States, I mean, obviously there's the exchange rate and our dollar is not worth <laughs> much at all anymore. Um, but even even to travel within Canada, I mean, our airfare is so much more expensive. Um, hotels tend to be a bit more expensive um, and and we're a lot more spread out. Uh, and so it's really it's really expensive to travel. I mean, even as much as, you know, I still really want to go to a lot of the competitions and different conferences and stuff. I mean, we're talking, you know, sometimes it's a year of saving to get two of us there because it's, you know, it's thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, I think also, I mean, I don't know that there's a lot of difference between, you know, styles of play, styles of dress um, that I think that, that as you travel, you kind of, you know, each community has its little quirks about it. Um, I do think though that in Canada, um, there's a lot more people who are isolated from their communities just because of, of how much spread there is. I mean, you know, around here, like we have Montreal, we have Ottawa, we have Toronto that all have like somewhat large communities. Um, I'm sure there's probably something in Winnipeg, maybe Calgary, um, and for sure Vancouver. But outside of that, I mean, that, and that's like covering an entire country. Those are sort yes. of the big communities that, that, um, that off the top of my head, I know of that have events and stuff. And so, um, you know, sometimes I think about like, oh, if I lived in San Francisco or if I lived in, you know, Chicago, like how easy it would be to sort of get around and get to different events. I also though think that we're pre- pretty hardy here and so i i'd like to think that you know our bottoms play a bit harder our tops play a bit harder because we're just used to surviving right yeah. like we survive our winters when close to famine sometimes <laughs> like um yeah i i think that for sure like when you have less access to community you're more appreciative of the community that you have and so I think that that sometimes is one of the differences I notice is that Canadians are just really grateful to be in community and so excited. Um, I've always, you know, sometimes I hear like, oh, you Canadians, you always bring the party. I'm like, we have to bring the party. We're really excited to be here. You do this all the time. This is this is a huge deal. So, What's the biggest misconception about you? Oh, that's a really... <laughs> Huh, that might be a hard one. <clears throat> I think I think that sometimes and this is more I think now that I'm in a role in the community as a top, I think that there is this like idea of me as like this big scary top who is not approachable or um you know like uh, every once in a while I have someone say like oh my god I was so afraid to talk to you and I'm like I'm literally probably the nicest person you'll ever meet like I'm like a puppy who like is at a pound and I'm just like be my friend be my friend be my friend be my friend um I mean I certainly you know I I play hard um I love that but I also you know, I'm super friendly. I'm really all about building community. Um, I love new people, not because I'm like, ooh, new people, um, but because I want to see people thrive in our community and come into their own. Um, I, you know, I'd love for folks to feel the same support that I had. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest misconception is that like, Either I'm like just big and scary or um, or that because like I run groups or I'm, you know, in sort of some leadership positions that like I'm not approachable. I'm literally like show up with the butter tart and I'm your best friend. Like, what do you need? Leather Dad Jason, thank you for an amazing interview for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. 
thanks for having me. This is wonderful. I'm so glad that you're helping to keep our history alive. It's my pleasure, I assure you.